Good afternoon. We're very pleased uh, to be able to host in the adjacent gallery uh, the writers, portraits by Laura Wilson. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome Laura to the center this afternoon to speak with Chip McGrath about her photography and about this remarkable project. As this audience knows, uh, the Ransom Center holds the personal and professional papers of many of our finest writers. And it's also an institution equally committed to capturing and preserving the visual record of our time. This exhibition combines in a very satisfying way two of the Ransom Center's key collecting areas. The poet Seamus Heaney, who's featured in the Laura Wilson exhibition, once said that his aim as a writer was to establish a complete congruence between the imaginative inner life where the poems come from and the outer self that one presents to the world. On another occasion, he spoke of the goal being, in his words, self-possession. That's a good description, I think, of many of the subjects of Laura Wilson's portraits. Looking at her work, we often sense a synchronicity between the imaginative inner life and the outward life that these portraits convey with such power. This project began simply enough, create a series of portraits of writers represented in the Ransom Center's collections. Laura worked on this project, as Laura worked on this project, the, scro the, excuse me, the scope grew uh, far beyond even the expansiveness of the Ransom Center's collections. And this exhibition, in fact, includes many writers who are not yet in the Ransom Center collection. It's been a pleasure, a great pleasure, to watch the project grow over the years and a great pleasure to share it with you this afternoon. Yale University Press has published a companion volume of this body of work and copies of the writers, portraits by Laura Wilson, will be available for sale following this talk. And I'm sure Laura would be happy to sign copies for you. Laura has published six previous collections of her work, including Watt Matthews, of Lamb's Head, The Hutterites of Montana, Avedon at Work, Grit and Glory, A Study of Six-Man Football, and That Day, Pictures of the American West, and most recently from Rodin to Plinza. Joining Laura in conversation about her work is Chip McGrath, a contributing writer for the New York Times and former deputy editor of The New Yorker and former editor of the New York Times Book Review. Chip is the author, most recently, of The Summer Friend, a moving memoir about the pleasures of summer's past and of their loss. Please join me in giving Laura Wilson and Chip McGrath a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate those kind remarks, and um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we, uh, as I think Steve said, I started this project 12 years ago, and by the time the book was printed in Italy, and we went to Verona to oversee the process, and got the prints made, printed, and then framed and down here to the Ransom Center. It feels as though I just finished the project about 12 minutes ago. So I'm awfully glad you're here. This is Sam Shepard, as you can see, and Charles uh, Chip McGrath wrote the foreword, and Louise Erdrich, who won the Pulitzer Prize last year, uh, so wrote an introduction. So I feel so lucky to have had this group of writers and these two people involved in the project. I feel it's been like a grand slam. Louise Erdrich here on the back porch of her Victorian house in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She's part Native American from the Chippewa tribe and she has a wonderful independent bookstore that she 
owns and operates in Minneapolis, just a block or two from her house. And uh, here, a native man has come in and is showing her his book of poetry, which she listened very attentively to him and um, showed great interest in his work. Just as my assistant and I were leaving the uh, Louise's house, her neighbor came over, Jim Martin, and he had a watering can that he had repaired for her. And uh, so he was returning it to her that morning. And I, they both looked, though they were enjoying each other. And I said, well, let, just a minute, let me take your picture before, um, before, you, before we leave. And so uh, they said, fine. And Jim Martin said, well, what do, you, what do you want us to do? And I said, well, just, just talk to each other. And so Jim, not being a performer at heart, immediately began a joke. And he was telling this uh, quite involved joke. And I think it was going in a direction that alarmed Louise. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't really paying attention. I was worrying about f-stops and shutter speeds. But Louise was having the burden of this joke going in a direction that made her nervous. So, but then, like a real performer, he pulled it out, out and uh, gave her a kiss and with a sign of relief for Louise. David McCullough is the only writer that I knew uh, before I began the project. He was a close friend of our family's, and he, lives, uh, or he lived in West Tisbury on Martha's Vineyard. And he worked every day in a tiny house that was just eight feet a shack, really, a shed, I should say, not a shack. Um, and it was, and it still is, eight feet by 10 feet. And he worked on a royal typewriter, as you can see here. And when he was writing, he would face south. And when he was thinking, he'd face north. And this is the, um, the shed, and, uh, which he called his office. And they, he and his wife had bought an acre of land in West Tisbury. And their old house was at the front of the acre. And when David moved this shed, he moved to the very, very back of the property, right up against that fence line, which you can see there. And the reason he did was because he wanted to be as far away from, as possible from the hoopla of a family of five little children in and out of the house and school every day. David was a terrific person, as you can see here. And he really, when Truman hit the bestseller list and he won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, we gave a party for him. And he came to visit us and came with Rosalie. That's his wife on the right. And my husband, former husband, Bob, on the left. What I discovered, even though uh, after, after getting to know so many writers, with this project is that they're just, they aren't one dimensional at all. And David, for instance, was a very good painter. He really a uh, superior watercolorist. And he could sing and dance. And at the drop of a hat, he'd like nothing better, especially if he was with Al Simpson, uh, the Wyoming senator. They both together like nothing better than singing that great Hank Williams song, Hey, Good Looking, What You Got Cooking. <laughs> Carlos Fuentes in Mexico City. This is the great uh, metropolitan cathedral, where, which is the oldest uh, and the largest cathedral in the Western Hemisphere. It's built on, the, this is the, um, the center, the historic center of Mexico City, on which uh, the Aztec Empire, on the ruins of which uh, were the Aztec Empire. Carlos, uh, his most favorite, Part of the city was a plaza, the Plaza de Santo Domingo, which some of you may know, which is just three blocks um, beyond <clears throat> the center, the historic center. He was very recognizable, uh, very elegant looking, white hair. He had been on TV a lot because he spoke about cultural things. And he was a great ambassador for Latin America. He was, in fact, a diplomat to France for many years. And he was uh, besieged by kids in the street when, when I was with him, photographing him. And he was so nice to them, to talk for many minutes to them. And at one point, a worker, a construction worker, had ran over to him while he was talking to his kids and said, would you 
please sign this. And it was the Bible. And so he was a bit taken back and he, but in the nice way he was, he put it on the uh, hood of a truck and began to sign his name. And as he began to sign it, he looked at me and he sort of smiled and said, should I really be doing this? <laughs> Uh, I'll show you these next two pictures because I think it will give you an idea of what I think is important in a portrait. Here, Carlos Fuentes, elegant, um, tall, uh, very appealing, handsome, famously handsome. But this, he, and he had led a very charmed life, both as a writer and a diplomat, and beloved by the Mexican uh, people. But he had also had great tragedy in his life. His two, uh, two of his children were killed at a, uh, at a very young age. And I think uh, Cartier-Bresson talks about this, the decisive moment. And I was changing film when I was photographing him in the previous way he was standing in the previous pictures. And I wasn't, I didn't really think I was getting anything. A anyone could have gotten that picture of him. Uh, but as I was bent over my camera changing the film, I looked up, and it really was the decisive moment. I saw on his face everything that said about his life, uh, about the tragedy and the heartbreak that he had experienced in life. And um, it, he actually died uh, two weeks after this. Uh, we did these pictures. Margaret Atwood in Toronto. Uh, she's an incredible force. Uh, as you know, she has been wildly successful. This is a uh, bookcases in her house, in her basement, 25 feet long and six feet high. Every single book on the shelf is, is, a, is by her. It's in a different language or a different edition. But every book is something, is her book. And that's an incredible, it was an incredible sight. She wasn't exactly friendly to us when we, my assistant Andrew Mitchell and I arrived, and we were told to stay outside, um, even though it was a kind of chilly March day. Uh, and, but she was to meet us, she said, I'll be out, I'll come out in the garden. She called this a garden. I, I didn't quite see it as a garden. <laughs> I mean, it, anyway, she came out of the house and didn't so much as say, hello, how are you, and yelled, you're standing on the ferns. So I look down, and I'm on flagstones that you can see right there. And Andy looks down, and he's at the edge of the fence. And he said, no, I'm, I'm on the ground. And she said, you're on the ferns, pointing directly at Andy. And he said, no, there, there are no ferns here. It's just, it's just ground. And she said, in the most exasperated way, they're under the ground. <laughs> And so then when I began photographing her, um, actually it's that little shed uh, right closest to, to the viewer where, she, um, where I asked her to sit. So the, the light was lovely. And I uh, was, again, adjusting the camera and, and getting things right. And I heard in this soft voice, but loud enough for both Andy and me to hear, you have your agenda? I have my agenda, and the ferns have their agenda. <laughs> and I, I thought, that is fantastic. It's like a, it's a real story. No wonder she has 25 feet of books in her house. <laughs> but she was, uh, she, I won't, won't say she was warm, but she was very cooperative, and she knew exactly what uh, I needed when I told her. I didn't want just a picture of her sitting at her desk writing. So she said, well, I garden. And so you know, these amazing pictures of her mulching and um, lifting this huge boulder. She's making a fountain in her backyard. So I was very grateful to her. And she, um, she was terrific. So I'll, I'll ask Chip to come out now, and maybe we can um, talk. <laughs> So I want to ask how you got started on this in the first place. So I've known you forever, and see, but you know, most of your work until this was set here in the West, and most of it 
was about people who were active rather than contemplative. Um, so what made you all of a sudden decide, oh, what I want to do next is take pictures of writers? Well, I was, went to a lecture, and it was John Updike giving the lecture. And um, after the lecture, someone said, well, you stand together. And it seemed very awkward to me, and I think to him too, but he was very graceful and, and nice about it. And he said, mm -hmm, come here. And so as I was standing next to him and people were talking to him, I thought, what a, um, what an unusual person he is. He, he seemed, and I thought, gosh, I'd love to do a portrait of him. And I knew that Chip knew him, and I thought, well, perhaps I could um, ask Chip if he would speak on my behalf, and I might be able to do a portrait of him. And so, uh, and then I also had in my mind some terrific pictures that were taken in 1962 by the very good photographer Dennis Stock, and they were pictures of Updike as a younger man, but dressed in street clothes, and he was um, at the edge of the ocean in Ipswich, Massachusetts, and he was playing that child's game where you go out to the, as the water's breaking, you go out, go out, go out, and then you jump back, keeping your head facing the water. You go back as fast as you can so you won't get your street clothes all wet. And uh, so there were pictures of him doing that. It was like stills from a home movie of a famous grown-up playing a child's game by the sea, and I thought they were wonderful. So I thought, well, if he has that kind of spirit, maybe he would um, be agreeable to being photographed. So that's sort of what began uh, in my mind. Uh, I was thinking of that. But then I dithered around and didn't get to it. And, and he died, and so uh, I thought, uh, I just really have to get going. And, he and would, he was, he, he's, was an exceptional person in many ways. He, he's, one way he's exceptional was, he's one of the very few writers I know who actually did, liked having his picture taken. He, he did a, like he it. He did like, he enjoyed it. Uh -huh. and, and he also, uh, he took great care about how his pictures appeared on his book. So today, my wife and I got a wonderful tour of the, of the part of the archive, and, and there's, the, there's a lot of correspondence between Updike and Knopf, his publisher. And I was reminded, at one point, he's fussing, as he often did, about the font and the size of the type size, and he was very meticulous. And he also cared a lot about the images. And, and I think in particular of when every few years he would publish one of these big compendiums, not a novel, um, but a collection of his nonfiction. And the, the, the cover was always a portrait. And so one year, the book was called Hugging the Shore, and it was up like in a dinghy. And, and another year, it was picked up pieces, and it was up like holding a bird's nest. And um, so it's too bad. I wish you, I, you would have you been along. But, but you've also said that part of what motivated you was your unhappiness with book jacket photos, the way so many yeah. authors look in the back of their books. So why? Well, I'll show you. Well, first of all, I never thought you could really see the person. They were often taken by, uh, you know, a, a, a husband or a wife who maybe wasn't didn't really know about photography. They weren't done by a first-rate photographer, a portrait photographer, and I always felt that they slighted the, the writer, and uh, I felt that I could do better. <laughs> and so, Comte Torbine. And uh, the reason I like this picture, and he actually used it on uh, one of his recent books, uh, is because, well, first of all, he has a monumental head. And he's looking <laughs> directly into the camera. And there's no, it's no nonsense. It's a, it's a, a real uh, a strong um, engagement with the viewer. And I think that that's, why would you want to uh, look at a picture where the person's looking away. I mean, you don't want to talk to a person when they're looking away. Uh, and so I think, first of all, a, the portrait, the writer, should be looking directly at the camera. For instance, in this picture of Richard Ford, where he, of course, he's very handsome, but these amazing eyes, uh, which make him very striking looking. And he used this on the dust jacket of, of um, the book that he did, Canada. And uh, so I, I feel <laughs> that the writers deserve a good portrait. And I think part of what makes a good portrait is the 
subject looking directly at the camera, not necessarily smiling, not with the hand up to the chin. Well, yeah, that's the, the, the you know, it, it's not entirely true that the photos are taken by husbands and wives. You know, there, there are several very good photographers, Nancy Crampton and Jill Cremens, who, mm -hmm. who have done very good work. And, but the, the book Jacket Photo has become a kind of art form into itself. And I think, and it's a marketing tool. And you do get a lot of this, you know, and these poor postures that nobody would take. But on the other hand, I have to say that, so I have a book out, um, and my jacket photo is one that you wouldn't approve of. But I love it, because it makes me look a thousand times better than I really look. <laughs> no, I actually <laughs> like that picture very much. <laughs> um, so, so what, besides looking straight at you, what do you look at? What makes a good portrait for you? What, what? Well, I, I, I think not backing away from the look of a person. Um, so, and uh, a kind of, um, uh, I, I think the straightforward as much as anything. Um, and, and I don't think the smile necessarily is beneficial, that you don't, uh, you don't get much about the personality or the, um, or, or the inner, what might be behind the person with a smile. I think a smile is like a mask. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm beginning, as I was thinking about talking to you this evening, you know, I, I thought in some ways the whole notion of, of taking pictures of writers is sort of paradoxical because it's not like taking a picture of, a, of an actor or a dancer. You know, what a writer looks like has no relation to what he or she puts on the page. And yet, and yet, part of why we want to look at these pictures is, is we think, anyway. We think we're going to learn something about their character, about their personality. Um, and I think, I think in great portraits, that really does happen. How? Well, I think uh, Tim O'Brien is a, a very good example. He lives uh, here in San Marcos, Texas, and he is the only magician that um, is in this group of uh, pictures of writers that I photograph. But he, for his own um, sense of pleasure and for his family, he does magic tricks. And he, he says magic for him is um, like fiction writing. It's a form of an illusion. And so he, he was such a, a warm, um, kind person in giving me t the time to photograph, photographing his children, his <laughs> wife. But uh, I said to him after a day, uh, may I do a portrait of you? And without me saying one word, this is what he faced when he faced the camera. So here the person who is interested in magic and loves his small children and has fun with his children. He can he has the sensitivity and the emotional um, can, to reach within himself. And this is a real portrait. And I didn't ask him to look this way. I mean, this is a person who's seen the brutality and the savagery of war. Uh, so I, uh, that's what I wonder, Chip, is what is, and I found this almost across the board in all writers, that they were very comfortable in front of the camera. They were very confident. They never seemed, they never said, oh, I, you know, I, can, I don't. I think, I think this, this has, must have a lot to do with you. And I'll get to that later, because I don't think everybody has that experience. Um, the, but so the other thing I'm curious about is, so I, I was fascinated when I was waiting backstage. You said you use film um, still. I no, I don't still use it, but oh, I did use it did. on this project. It began so long ago in the dark ages uh, that I was using film then, and I was very late to go to a digital camera. I just switched to a digital camera maybe a couple of years ago. So this is film, for okay. instance. So, and you also mentioned I heard you, I overheard you say that that you know you, the, when you when you caught this great moment with Fuentes, you were actually you were changing the. The, yeah, the changing film. the camera, yeah. and then it's, at some other point you said you were worrying about f-stops. So how much of this is technical? How much is just yeah. knowing what you're doing? I think that none of it is technical. I don't think it has to do with the lighting. I don't think it has to do with the camera. In fact, uh, Bruce Chatwin, 
in his book in the Patagonia, uh, is talking to an old lady in South America. I, it must be in Patagonia. And um, she said, he was asking her about her uh, photography. And she said, the camera is such a killjoy. And I really think that, that the camera is a killjoy. And so I think it has to come from the mind and heart of the photographer, uh, that it's the content that matters. Meaning what? Meaning I, I don't think it matters about the, fil uh, the, the film and the, and the shutter speed. Well, I shouldn't say that. You do have to be experienced enough to uh, be comfortable with the equipment. But the equipment isn't going to make the good portrait. Um, the what good, is? The, I think it's the person. It, I think it's really the gift of the person. And um, it's not luck. It's not skill. It's, um, and it is a kind of a decisive moment that you just, Cartier-Bresson was great. And the reason he was great was he was always alert and always looking for what would make a strong, graphically and emotionally, a strong picture. So are you, are you, so do you know when you're doing it, you think, ah, oh, that's the one? Do you, or do you, do you not, or do you not know until you go back and, and, and look at what you've done? Uh, I think that um, I'm always surprised. Uh, so for instance, with Tim O'Brien, I thought, you know, I, he's being polite and I'm, and he's giving me the time to get a good, but it wasn't until I got back home and in the studio, in the dark room uh, studio, saw this amazing expression, this really uh, heartbreaking look into the camera, and also with Carlos Fuentes. I mean, that was, you know, the frame before, the frame after. It wasn't there. It was just that momentary. This was uh, a, a different uh, experience. It was uh, a quieter. Um, I had more time here. So you just said there's, there's no luck involved, and um, which interests me um, because the one of my favorite portraits in this book is the one of Tom Stoppard, and the and he's someone that's been photographed a jillion times. We think we, he's a very handsome looking man, and, and we've we've grown up with him. You know, we've watched him age, and the but your photograph of him is I think the best I've ever seen. And the, but the, the, uh, the curious thing, as you say in the book, he was, he's the one that you have spent the least time with. You had like 20 minutes, right? It was less than 15 <laughs> minutes. It was like 12 minutes. So that's got to be but a But that a was a bit. gift from him. We'll get to that. I'm not sure when. Oh, we'll come to it. Yeah, yeah. we'll come to we'll it. We'll come to it later. We can talk about it because that's. Um, uh, Majan Satrapi uh, is a comma is a um, graphic novelist, but she wants to be called, a com she prefers to call herself a comic novelist. And she's the only comic novelist in the book. And she had a very hard life, if you have read Persepolis and, uh, and know about her. She grew up in Iran, and she was sent by her parents away um, to go to school in Vienna uh, when she was uh, 14 years old because she was in such, um, she was so vulnerable to this repressive um, society in which they lived, and they were afraid that she would be jailed for her um, behavior. And then she returned, she had a very hard time in Vienna for four years. She returned to an unhappy marriage in Tehran, and then finally now she is in Paris, where she just looks great, I think. And uh, I um, said to her, I don't know how you've done it. You know, this, this confidence and this um, uh, confidence. And she said, I'm part Iron Man and I'm part Captain America. And, uh, and I think that's true. And she really, and I think this portrait, completely different from the Carlos Fuentes, that shows the strength of um, her inner strength. And it's a different kind of picture. So her, her hair is blowing. Is that just that luck, or is that something? That was luck. luck. So there is luck. Yeah. <laughs> there was, the breeze, she was facing a, a, bre a breeze. Well, that and it gives, was very to lucky. me, that gives the picture a kind of aliveness. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. So I want to go back to something else that you said when I was hiding off stage. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about sort of the monumentality of some of these, and Contobin being a great example. To my mind, he looks like one of those Easter Island statues, those great monumental. Yeah. And, and I think Annie Prue 
looks like a rodent. And, mm -hmm. and, and my, I have to say, my favorite picture maybe in the whole thing is Jim Harrison. I mean, there are so, <laughs> there are so many miles on that face. That's it's right. It's astonishing. The, um, and so, I mean, that's obviously that's a, a gift to a photographer. But, but I'm also struck by, as you leaf through this book or walk through the gallery, so many of these people are striking looking. They are, some of them are just plain good looking. Yes. Sam Shepard and yes. Richard Ford. And I mean, mm -hmm. and the, and I'm just, I'm curious, the, do we think that there's some connection between the writerly vocation and, and being interesting looking, being interesting on the page and interesting in the flesh, or is that just an accident? I think that th that's a something, a question that I also have, uh, because no matter what the person looked like uh, when I approached him or her, um, some are quite ordinary looking, August Kleinsoller, for instance, you, you, you'd never think, oh gosh, that will be somebody I'd like to photograph. But um, there's something about writers, unlike any other group of people I've photographed, that writers have uh, this ability to reach inside themselves and, and the confidence and the sort of inner dignity to stand in front of the camera and not be self-conscious and not be shy. So I don't know what that is, Chip. In fact, I really, it, they all had it. I mean, I didn't have to well, uh, encourage it's, it's, that. It's fascinating to me because in my experience, most writers are, well, they're like all of us. They're vain and their vanity takes the form of pathological shyness and self-consciousness. And, um, and I'm amazed that you, you got all these people to do it. I mean, I remember you and I had endless phone conversations and you know, who, who, who's on the wish list? Who, yes. would, who would we like to get, blah, blah, blah. And, and that you got so many of these people to do it. How did you do that? It was hard. It, was, it took, I mean, so long. And um, well, I'll proceed here and see if, uh, well, here's Tom There's Stoppard. There's the Stoppard, yeah. So yeah. that photograph to me, that says everything, and it, and it, and it, in my mind, though I haven't seen the new play yet, I'm hoping to. This is, the new play is the one where he comes to grips with this, this his Jewish past, yes. which he's sort of half a race for half his life. Yes. And I think I can see this now, this kind of sadness in this picture. Right. Um, amazing. Yeah. I mean, this and this. Uh, Chip was referring to the fact that I didn't have very much time with Stoppard. He had been quite cooperative in in being willing to be photographed but we weren't able to be, uh, I wasn't able to connect with him until one time he called me and he said, okay, I've got 15 minutes before I need to get on a flight and I'm going to be having dinner with my wife and children and I'm going to be in Covent Garden. I've got 15 minutes. If you want to come and photograph me there, fine. So I rushed over um, to Covent Garden and it was teeming with people. I mean, people everywhere. And there was no way I could have him stand in the, in the street. So I thought, oh, the restaurant where he's going to have dinner, that's where I'll. So we walked in there, and it seemed perfect. And so I said, oh, Mr. Stoppard, I've, when he arrived, I said, I found the perfect spot for you. And, and he said, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to be photographed in there with people. I would disturb everyone's dinner. No, I can't do that. So then I thought, yikes. Already, it was eight minutes were used up. And so, um, so I was very worried, and I knew how lucky I was to even have the opportunity to photograph him. So it was a lot of pressure. And we happened to find just a, a, a colonnade under which he's standing, and this late, lovely, late English light um, was coming in on his face. And uh, he said, OK. Uh, what do you want? You want me smiling, or do you want me serious? What, what do you want? And I said, and I looked into the camera, and I couldn't. I mean, it was exactly an incredible look. And with you know one or two frames, that was it. So that is a gift, and that wasn't something that I, um, you know, it, it, it. He has an amazing face, and it happens that I knew what I wanted with no, that and face. Probably the fact that he has been photographed so much means that he, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm still, I'm still amazed that you were able to talk some of, you talked Cormac McCarthy into having this picture. <laughs> I mean, well, he, he, haven't, he hasn't had his, or Cormac yeah, but, but Cormac McCarthy hasn't had his picture taken in Can we 50? go to Cormac McCarthy? So you, there, there he is, he is. okay. Back, yeah. 
He hasn't had his picture taken in 50 years. It's like, as I, <laughs> as I say in, the, in, the, uh, in my introduction, it's like Garbo. I mean, right. so how right. did you get him? He was very hard to get. I, I wrote to him. I knew where he, I had his address. He was at the Santa Fe Institute, and so I wrote there and sent him a book and nothing. So I thought, oh, well, maybe he was traveling. He didn't get it. So I write a second letter, another book, send it to him, nothing. So then I spoke to a friend of mine who said he was a friend of Cormac McCarthy's. He said he would speak to him, nothing. So I thought, well, he can't be that good a friend because it, anyway. Um, and then I spoke to his agent, um, Amanda. Pinky, Pinky Urban. Uh, yes. Yeah. And who t tell about her a bit about her? Well, she's she's, she's my agent, so I'm prejudiced. <laughs> I think she's the best, and she she represents, the exception of me, the good people, and um, the and she's been very loyal to Cormac, and and so I've been trying. I've been for years. I've been wanting to write about Cormac, and she's try she has tried to put the two of us together, and she's failed. So I'm just amazed. So she, here's what happened. So um, I found out because I have a, a good friend, the man on the left over there with the dark glasses is a friend of mine. His name is James Drake, and he's an artist. He lives in Santa Fe. And he told me he was very close to Cormac McCarthy, that they would have lunch together, they would have breakfast together. And Cormac McCarthy had two friends, James Drake and the other person, David Krakow, who's the head of the Santa Fe Institute, a young uh, astrophysicist. And so, um, I, and I was in Santa Fe, and I thought, I'll make an arrangement to have meet James, and we had lunch together, and I thought, okay, this is the time I'm going to ask James to, if I may, photograph, um, if he would speak on my behalf to photograph Cormac McCarthy. And so I, um, you know, all through lunch, I didn't have the courage. I just thought, I can't put him on the spotlight. It's just, it would be too, um, it'll be so mortifying for him to have to say, to go to, well, he probably wouldn't go to Cormac McCarthy, he'd just say no to me. So I didn't ask him. And uh, I was in a, in a funk later that afternoon in a little coffee shop, and in came David Krakauer, and who I also know. And David said, what are you up to? And I said, well, I'm just you know, feeling despondent. I had lunch with a very good friend, a close friend of Cormac McCarthy's, and the one opportunity I have to actually photograph him, I don't have the courage to say, will you do, do me this favor? And he said, well, who, who's the friend? Uh, I'm a friend of Cormac McCarthy's. And uh, he said, I'm having lunch with him on Thursday. I'll ask him for you. So wow. he did. And then, uh, but Cormac McCarthy agreed because of these two friends. Uh, and so the, these pictures are in James Drake's studio. And then we went to, and you can see, I mean, they're wonderful pictures. Of, that's very good <laughs> to have those, uh, the fun that they're having together, well, you know, real the, friends. The, the, the fact that he has these friends at the Institute and has spent so much time at the Institute, I think is going to help explain something. So he, McCarthy has two books coming out this month or next month. And they're really, they're one book. They're one big book and one little book. One's about a brother, one's about a sister. And Ideally, they should be published as a box set, and I think eventually they will be. Um, they're brilliant, uh, but they're unlike any Cormac McCarthy you've ever read, because they're full of physics and mathematics. <laughs> and you know, and, and if you if you struggle with ninth grade algebra as I did, it, it's a it's a bit of a struggle. But the you can see how much he's got from these people, and he, and he's amazing. He's been able. To Put this into, into a novel. It's, it's, uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's, Here he is in the library, which he gave this library to the uh, institute, and so the three of them visiting, and and you can see how comfortable he yeah. is and how much he enjoys being with them. So how much this it has to have helped, a kind of critical mass. I mean, at a certain point, were you able to? to say, to, well, you're trying to get a writer to agree, you're able to say, well, look, I've got Garcia Marquez, I've got Carlos <laughs> Fuentes, don't you want to be on this team? Yeah, did that yeah. ever, did yes, that cut some ice with some of yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I always, you know, I, I wrote a very brief letter, um, less than a page, and but I always said who uh, the big writers that I had already. And this is another person another, who was, Exactly, but I mean, he's, he's not quite as elusive as, as um, 
McCarthy, but he has, you don't see him. You don't see his picture a lot. Right, and this is um, Haruki Murakami, the great Japanese novelist. And uh, when I was writing to his assistant, trying to set something up, uh, it was very difficult because it was exactly when the pandemic was at its height, and he couldn't. I couldn't go into Japan, and he couldn't leave Japan. And so, uh, you know, two years went by of back and forth, and then finally he said. It just he had, there was a brief opening where he could leave Japan, and so he said, "I'm going to um, Honolulu to run a marathon." And so, at 72 years old, he runs. A, he it was he ran a marathon, the Hawaiian marathon, but Honolulu marathon. But he's run 45 marathons. He's amazing, and I didn't know what he looked like. Uh, and we were to meet in a kind of a, a public um, kind of shopping area. And I thought, gosh, I, I don't want to be kind of looking around to try and find who, who, who he is. And, but this man walked around a building, and he had such a youthful, energetic walk and such a, uh, uh, such a bright expression on his face. I knew it was Murakami, yeah. not knowing at all what he looked like. And it was he. And uh, he's also a great collector of... Um, vinyl records, and so in Honolulu, we went into this uh, vintage record store, and he brought his little satchel, the way you might bring a satchel of books, he brought his satchel of uh, old vinyl records to trade with the bookstore owner, and he said, I go all over, I go to Berlin, I go to London, one of the best places is Portland, Maine, for old vinyl records, jazz, and um, classical music. And then this was a happy uh, circumstance that I was interested in Paul Theroux, but I hadn't uh, had a chance to contact him. But Murakami knew him and said, I'm going up to uh, visit uh, Paul Theroux. And uh, I said, gosh, that would be wonderful if I might uh, go with you. And he said, yes, of course. And so here, again, uh, the pleasure of two good friends. So you talked earlier about how you know the, the the writers were welcoming and and at ease I, 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 it's, it's, I find that kind of astonishing because I know from experience that personal experience that some of the people you take pictures of are truly formidable scary and Atwood is one and you mentioned that and the and you know I, one of my scariest experiences ever was, was with A.S. Byatt and I remember I was I was intimidated to begin with, and then I, I went to see her, and we're making small talk before the interview. This is by it. We're making small talk before the interview, and she said, well, you know, what do you read for relaxation? What do you read in bed at night? And I said, well, I don't know, spy thrillers. And she looked at me like I was a cretin. <laughs> and, and it turns out that what she reads in bed at night is Thomas Mann in German. <laughs> <laughs> so... How did you? How do you get these people to warm up? In a, you know, well, um, uh, with A. S. Byatt, I had photographed four other writers in in, in and around London, and uh, and it w this was you know at the end of a long week, and I hadn't done my preparation, and uh, I was being I was very nervous, because not having read uh, some and not having I just didn't know anything about about her really. I mean, I knew she was formidable. So I said to my, my close friend, an English friend, Dido Crosby, I said, Dido, come with me. Dido went to Oxford. I said, Dido, come with me. And you, you can chat with her while I'm getting the camera set up. And she I wouldn't go to see Dame Byatt. She's fearsome. And so I thought, oh my gosh. And so when we got to her house, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's that I don't try and uh, chat with them, I just say, uh, I'm very businesslike, and so I'd say, may I, um, may we look around, uh, just give us 20 minutes to look around and, and find a spot that would have a um, nice light that I might do, do the portrait of you. And she said, yes, you go anywhere you want, go in the garden, go. And so she went back into the living room and watched a snooker match on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and she was so nice. Uh, she was very, very nice. And then uh, when I sat her here, she's facing her garden. So this is just an open door with a garden light coming in on her. And uh, I, I, so as she, she sat down, we, and I was all set with the right 
sh uh, shutter and f-stop, and I leaned forward to take the masking tape from her hand. She said, no, no, no. And I said, no, it's, it, you know, I'm, I'm going to do the picture now. And she said, no, no, this is what calms my nerves. I always hold this in interviews, TV or anything. So I actually think it makes the picture. The, did, did, the, did the writers ever themselves ever suggest you might want to try this or ever suggest a setting? I mean, settings, it turns out, settings are it's a kind of sub-theme in the book, I think, is the not only are these people fascinating to look at, many of them live in fascinating places, and, and, and the book uh, suggests that. And I'm wondering, do they ever suggest, oh, well, come look at this river or this bunkhouse or whatever? Yes. Is that, or, or? I always, I didn't with Dame Byatt, but uh, it was all the other writers I had done, um, I had looked into them carefully enough so I knew exactly where they lived and I knew the kind of country they were in. Uh, so I, uh, and I knew that I wanted to show that. Now, I'm not a landscape photographer, but I felt that where, and they live in wonderful places, every single one of them, even Jim Harrison's little adobe house that you think is going to fall down at the, you know, the next blue norther that comes through uh, is perfect inside. And I, I don't know what that is. I mean, what is it that writers have such really wonderful places where they live? Oh, thank you. Um, they're visual. That's the other thing. That um, so, uh, it, it, so setting, for instance, this is Edwige Dandicat in Miami, and with palm, uh, wonderful, huge. I don't know if there's bananas or palms, but in front of her house, and she uh, loved. Uh, She's right on the edge of Little Haiti, and, and because she grew up in, in Haiti and didn't come to this country until she was uh, 12 years old. But she, living in Miami on the edge of Little Haiti, she goes there every day and has a coffee and visits with friends, and the woman selling dresses and the man cutting the coconut, and visits this wonderful bookstore, which is, um, has been over 30 years in existence in uh, little Haiti, and, and this man public, has only French and uh, Haitian and Creole books. It's an wow. amazing bookstore and just wonderful to be in. So you can see the pleasure that she has in being there. Both, and she's, his, her books are sold there by him, but she's visiting with a friend who's a community activist. Uh, I, and then here is Richard Ford's beautiful um, Bay right off of his house, a, a Cape Cod house in outside of Booth Bay, Maine, and the little writer's um, little shed. It was a lobsterman's uh, where he restored his dories in the wintertime, and, and Richard Ford has turned it into a, uh, a place to write. It's work. interesting, that, you know, because Richard, for most of his life, was peripatetic. He, he couldn't settle down anywhere. He lived in, he lived in Mississippi, he lived in Montana. He lived in New Orleans, he lived in New York, and with that back. And so, and it's odd that he's finally found a home in Maine, of all places. But, but the picture suggests to me that he really is, this is his place now. Yes, I mean, he was here, I think, for 20 years. But when I said that uh, we wanted to send him a book, and what's his current address? Billings, Montana. Oh, there, see, you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what about your beautiful house in Maine? Sold it. I said, see, there, that's Richard. There, that's, wow. Yeah. I couldn't believe that he sold it. And this great place, Tom McGuane, that you were here. I've Chip, been there, yeah. That's the most amazing, one of the most amazing places I've ever been. Um, and uh, his, he lives with his wife, uh, Lori Buffett, who's Jimmy Buffett's sister, yeah. along with his hunting dogs. And it's a cabin that was built in 1903 with logs floated down. Um, the river that runs right behind the I mean, it's this beautiful cabin. That's amazing. And here, where he... So whose uh, idea was that, to take him asleep? His or you? Uh, well, I said, I noticed you have a little cot there right <laughs> next to your... <laughs> his desk where he writes every day is sort of where I'm, I am right here. And walk around the desk, he had that cot, and I thought, gosh, that's just great. And uh, I, I did... Um, Suggest that, but it's something he does. No, no, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. And um, 
and I think you were saying, Chip, how uh, many pictures were that you felt that people were. Yeah, that's in. the other thing I wanted to ask you. So we think of writing as a, as a solitary task, which it, it is. But I was struck by so, how many of the pictures show writers being sociable, laughing, having fun. Um, and again, was that something that happened by accident because people happened to be around or, or um, you know, the, the, the Rachel Cusk pictures, for example, was great. There's a whole happy dinner party going on. And McMurtry, I think, the same. Mm -hmm. Is, was that just, again, an accident? Or? No. Uh, well, here, Seamus Heaney, with his wife, had come to say goodbye as we're leaving. He was high on steps in his doorway in Dublin. And so we had walked down the steps. And we look, uh, I looked back. They had both come to the door to say goodbye. And they looked so happy and so great. I said, oh, may I take a picture? And, um, and they were amused by that. And, uh, and I took two. So, uh, and then Rachel Cusk, who lives in this very isolated <coughs> place in Norfolk, England, and it's uh, on the edge of the North Sea in this thousands of acres of uh, salt marsh. And she lives, leads a very isolated life with her husband, the architect. Um, and they're really essentially home buddies, but a couple of times a week they go into a, this, uh, the Red Lion pub in Stiffkey and visit. And so I, I think you've uh, said to me, Chip, that um, writers are fun. I mean, they are they're fun. They are fun when they're not being, you know, gloomy. Yeah. <laughs> they they're, but they're good conversationalists. Yeah. Yes, they are. A yeah. And they have great sense of humor. Yeah, they are funny. Even the ones who aren't funny are funny. <laughs> so the, um, we want to leave a little time for questions. So I'm going to ask you uh, two last questions. One, if you're willing to say, did you have, do you have any favorites among these? Well, oh, yes. I, I'll show you my, one of my favorite okay. pictures. So this is Tobias Wolf, very, um, very correct, a lovely man. He's, um, he had a, quite an outlandish father. Have you read The Duke of Deception? Of course, yeah. Uh, which uh, his brother wrote about the father who was a schemer and a liar and a cheat and uh, just the worst, what would seem to me, the worst kind of father. And yet he has these two terrific sons. One is the head of writing at um, Stanford and the other at uh, Berkeley. In any case, Tobias Wolf is a lovely person. And, um, but I was trying to, he, he was quite, um, well, I couldn't seem to break through. I mean, I, walking with his dog, yes, that's fine. But in suburban uh, Stanford or sitting at the piano, yes. But nothing, I really couldn't, I had to get a, something better. So I said, what do you do? What other things do you do? Well, I, I swim every day. He was very, I said, I'm hesitant to say that. And I said, that's exactly, exactly what I want. So here, that's a pretty good picture of a writer. And uh, I felt very lucky to get that. And it was a surprise. Uh, number one, that he was willing to let me do it. And number two, uh, when I got back out of the dark room, I mean, I, I, it looked good when I was standing on the edge of the diving board looking down, but it looked even better uh, when you see a print because of the strength, the graphic strength yeah. of it. So my last question <clears throat> is you began by saying that you wished you had been able to take Updike. Who else do you wish, who else did you not get that you wish were in I this would book? love to get, and this is your assignment, Chip, <laughs> <laughs> when we leave here. I'd love to photograph Alice Munro. That's not going to happen. I, that's what you said about no, Cormac no. McCarthy. Well, that's what well, you no, said no. about. Well, no, 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 no. Alice is in, uh, is in assisted care, and I, think, and I think her daughter would not allow it. Mm -hmm. She's not in good shape. Mm -hmm. It's too bad. It would have been wonderful. Yeah. The, I, I, I visited her about 10 years ago, and you would have loved it, and it would have been great uh, pictures. So she lives in, this t in Clinton, Ontario, in the middle of nowhere, and lives in this tiny bungalow, or lived, down by the railroad tracks. And the, and the house, inside the house, the, she was married, her second husband was, this guy was a big deal Canadian geographer, he was head of the Canadian Atlas. So he had this great big study with a giant globe, and maps on the wall. And Alice wrote at the dining room table <laughs> with a window overlooking the driveway. 
Elizabeth. Wow. <laughs> wow. But the, but the backyard, the, 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 the geographer husband was also this kind of wacky amateur sculptor. So there was things like bathtubs painted to look like Holstein cows. <laughs> and, and you, would, you, would have, you would have a field day. <laughs> That's funny. The one I miss, um, and it's, it's, it's instructive, I think, is, is Philip Roth. And so Philip and I were friendly, and I persuaded Philip to agree to let Laura take his picture. And, um, and then, you know, between us, we let too much time go by. And then, and then when it, ha it happened, so when Philip gave what amounted to his, his last interview ever, so he, he did this with me, and there was a lot of backing and forthing about this interview. And so Philip insisted that uh, he had to see the questions in advance. And this is against Time's policy. And I, he was worried, needlessly so, that he, about mm -hmm. he, he was keeping his focus and not going off track. So the Times said, well, OK, we'll agree to that. But they wouldn't agree to his other condition. His other condition was if there had to be photographs, they needed to be taken by Nancy Crampton. Just to, mm -hmm. And the Times wouldn't agree to that. The, the photo desk was much more adamant than the editorial desk. And so they hired some freelancer, whose name I've forgotten. And I don't know if you remember, the pictures were god awful. They were dark and mm -hmm. pretentious and artsy and just the worst. And so, so you know, after a couple of weeks, I called Philip up and reminded him that he had agreed to let you do it. And he said, if I had to do that again, it would kill me. Mm -hmm. And so I, that tells me something, that he did not have the Laura Wilson experience. <laughs> <laughs> that was very nice of you, too. So on that note, um, if there are any questions, um, I'm sure Laura would be happy to answer them. Or Chip. Or me. He, Chip has in, interviewed so many right, of, right, and right, wonderful right. interviews There's somebody with so over many there. Of, right. writers. Um, well, I like Michael Anjaji very much. Um, I like so many of his books, and I like him as a person very much. So, um, but so many of them I like. I mean, um, so I can't say I have one favorite. I know that's a kind of wishy-washy answer, but it's true. Back there. Uh, what did I learn about from directing? Yeah, yeah, so that's a question I meant to ask. Thank you very much. So, so what do you do that's different from Avedon? What did you learn from him, and what do you do that's different? I learned a lot from him. I learned, again, this thing that I keep saying. It's not about f-stops and shutter speeds. It's really about looking, and it's, and it's really about being interested in people and being curious and open and ready. Uh, so. And also, I know what an interesting face is, and I don't know where that comes from. I mean, I was thinking um, before we got together that I had done a, um, I was an art student, and I had done a self-portrait, and it kind of looked like an Avedon, which is unusual for a young person to do <laughs> something that would be kind of uh, grim. Uh, but I think that um, I'm not, I, I have in my mind what I want, um, and I think, uh, I learned, and that, and also, uh, that's something that was within me, and it was heightened by being uh, with Richard Avedon. So the things that I thought uh, kind of naturally were um, amplified by working with him. And then I, of course, learned so much more. I mean, he used to say a great thing. Uh, we would be walking in through a crowd of people, and um, I would say, well, what about that? face over there. And he'd say, well, can it hold the wall? And that's a great expression, because you want a face that can really hold up um, and isn't going to look like every other quiet picture that you've seen, benign picture that you've seen. Thanks. That's a nice, good question, Susan. Um, Yale 
wanted very much Zadie Smith. I wanted um, either Tom, um, either um, Tom Stoppard or Richard Ford. And they said, um, no, we think, they urged me to have uh, a woman and they urged me to have a young person. Yeah, a young no person. Old, no yeah. old white guys. No old white guys. And they even used that, uh, I'm sorry to say, they even used that uh, term, no old white guys. And in one, um, in fact, Deb Garrison, who's a friend of yours, Chip, right. is she an, uh, an editor or, a agent, or an no, agent? She's an editor. She's an editor at that Knopf and Pantheon. You know, she's yeah. a wonderful person. Yeah. And uh, she said, if you choose, um, I'm telling you sort of things that I hope are, don't, Anyway, she said, if you choose Richard Ford, it will reflect badly on you, meaning I'm not, um, I'm not au courant enough to realize that it's shifted. And um, so that's why Zadie Smith. But it also happens to be a great picture. Well, yeah, yeah, she has a great face, doesn't she? Right. And she had a good look into the camera. Um, there's a picture of her in color in the exhibition, which you might enjoy seeing, where she has a, a kind of wry smile on her face. I think the cover picture is, it, it, it is a stronger picture, and it's more, a, I don't know about arresting that word, but uh, it, it, it will hold the wall. Where, uh, uh, but you also see another side to Zadie Smith, this lovely uh, sha, uh, questioning smile that she has in the, in the color photograph of her. I'm sorry, you'll have to speak louder. We can't hear you. Chip. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question for you. <laughs> I'll take the picture. <laughs> so, uh, you'll take the picture. I'll write the words. Okay. <laughs> Very what? For, yeah. No. No. No, I, I come in looking. Uh, and we begin maybe slowly. Uh, but I, I don't, I'm not. I don't engage in small talk. I especially don't talk about the book uh, books that I've read of theirs that they. No, no, I don't do that. It's it's the it they it's what they bring to the uh, to the camera, and that's why uh, in the case of Tom Stoppard or Tim O'Brien or Carlos Fuentes, it's the, it's a gift from them that that. But I. Um, uh, I go with a sense of seriousness, and 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 I think they respond to that. They know it isn't just a quick little uh, snapshot by a newspaper photographer. Excuse me, Chip. Uh, <laughs> uh, that you know, it, I think it, I think the guy that taught that took Roth thought he was an artiste. I mean, I think that was the whole problem. Would have been better if he was a newspaper photographer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, but I never say you know look to the left, look to the right. I. I uh, I, but I'm not waiting for it to happen either. I mean, there's, the, the other thing is maybe this is another reason writers are so comfortable. They know uh, what makes a story. And so they have a sense of what will make a picture. So even though uh, Tobias Wolf, the last thing in the world he wanted to do was to traipse down to the university pool and be photographed swimming. But he did it. I think he did it because he has a sense of a story, what makes a good story. He knew what would be a good picture. and. So that they, um, you know, often they would say, well, you might want to photograph here or there in their environment. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But. Well, J.M. could say, um, it, the picture that I did of him, I, I liked him very much and I, um, sent him a group of pictures, and he said, I wish I were smiling. <laughs> and, 
and I, 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 was, I was disappointed because I thought he, who had actually been very interested in photography as a young man and took some wonderful pictures at 14 and 15 years old, he's South African, and uh, I was disappointed that he didn't appreciate his own picture. Because no, I think, think about it. If you know Kutsia's work, a smile in Kutsia makes no sense at all. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I think they respond to <clears throat> the seriousness with which they see I'm working, and then they try and cooperate. I mean, they want they want me to be. Uh, I think I would say that that they want me to be successful. Uh, they want me to get I think, what I'm I looking think, for. I think you're being too modest. I think there's something else that there's something about your personality uh, that, in the, that you're you're such a good listener. Uh, you're, you're, I find your presence very soothing. I, I'm sure that all that comes Maybe. into it. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's you're not intimidating. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, I say in in um, the introduction of the book, I think it's no accident that so many of the great photographers and writers, going back to Margaret Cameron and Bernice Abbott, they've all been women. I can't think of a great <laughs> photographer of writers who's a man. And I think it has to do with Women it, not putting their ego in the way. You, you're willing yeah. to let the writer. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's very interesting because when I, uh, over a six year period, when I was working for Richard Abbott and, and, we did, and he did the portraits in the American West, it was the reason I was there was it was much easier for me as a woman to go up to a man and ask if he would mind, would agree to be photographed. And, and it was much easier as a woman to do it than a man. And it was also, of course, much easier for a woman to go up to another woman. So it may be a little of that, uh, Chip, that uh, uh, you know, a woman, when you're serious and you're polite and, you're, uh, and you know enough, I mean, they get it, right? They've been, all of these people have been photographed a lot. And they get it when you know what you're doing. And so I think they respond to yeah, that. Sure. Well then, that's it. Thank you all very much uh, for coming. You.